Collecting math books is really fun because you run across all kinds of books. This book is pretty different. It's called Basic Concepts of Elementary Mathematics. It was written by John Peterson. I think this book has a really, really cool cover. Yeah, really nice. So this book is primarily written for students who want to become teachers or teachers who are already teaching. It's also written for liberal arts students. So if you were to take a class in college today, like liberal arts math, or maybe math for elementary school teachers, you might see some of the topics found in this book. However, that's not to say it's not a book for someone who is studying mathematics simply for the sake of learning mathematics. The cool thing about books like this is that you find different types of math. The content in this book is different from the content in, say, an algebra book or a pre-calc book. You're going to find different topics, which make it a really, really fun book. Basic Concepts of Elementary Mathematics, John M. Peterson, Brigham Young University. The book was published in 1971. I don't know if there are other printings. This might be the only one. I do believe this book is out of print. This text is designed to meet the needs of three audiences, pre-service teachers, in-service teachers, and liberal arts students who desire an appreciation and understanding of the basic structure of mathematics. Assuming no prerequisite whatsoever, the language and style should be intelligible to the non-science student, yet it is mathematically sound throughout. Here's a look at the contents. It starts with an introduction to mathematics. So it discusses a little bit of logic. Then it goes into sets, relations, and operations. Then whole numbers. And then numeration system, ancient systems of numeration. Yeah, see, these are things that you normally wouldn't find in like a basic algebra book. Bases other than 10, different bases, changing bases, integers, an entire chapter on integers. Chapter six is on elementary theory of numbers. We have a little bit of number theory in the book rational numbers, and then we have some probability. So if you were to take a class in college today in, say, statistics, you would see some of these topics. Decimals and real numbers, some informal geometry, and then some coordinate geometry. Some of these things you would see in a college algebra class or a pre-calc class. And the last chapter is chapter 12, which talks about finite mathematics and mathematical systems. And you do have some answers to some of the exercises. However, you don't have answers to all of them. For example, the author does have some exercises that are proofs and those don't come with full solutions. Chapter one, introduction to mathematics. Let's read the first few sentences together. All too often the word mathematics is thought of as being synonymous with the word computation. Many people think of mathematics as being only a tool for use in the other sciences and in business. But in actuality, mathematics is a science in itself. Independent of physics, engineering, statistics, or any other discipline. To a large degree, much mathematical development has been purely theoretical, with practical applications of the theories having been found later. Although a great deal of our total mathematical knowledge still has no known application, engineers and physicists are constantly posing new problems for mathematicians to solve. 2.8 is on properties of set relations. So here it defines what it means for a relation to be reflexive, and then it gives an example, and then it defines what it means for a relation to be symmetric, and it gives an example. Then it does the same thing with the transitive property. It defines what it means for a relation to be transitive, and it gives you an example. And it does all of this because it wants to define an equivalence relation. A relation R is called an equivalence relation on a set S, if and only if R is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. You notice it says if and only if. Normally in math books, if you just say if, uh, and omit the only if, it's assumed to be an if and only if statement. So in mathematics, all definitions are assumed to be if and only if statements. However, here he purposely used the if and only if terminology, perhaps just to provide some extra clarity for the students who are reading this book. Equivalence relations are super important in mathematics and they show up in all different areas. And this book then uses equivalence relations later in the book. And I think that's really cool. I don't know if modern books with this target audience are written this way, but I am pretty impressed with the fact that the author is doing that. Equivalence of fractions. For any fractions a over b and c over d, a over b is equivalent to c over d, denoted by a over b 
is equivalent to C over D, if and only if AD is equal to BC. And here he gives you some examples. And this is basically leading up to the fact that he is going to describe rational numbers as equivalence classes. Let me go ahead and show you that. Definition 7.3, rational number. A rational number, and he has here the equivalence class of A over B, with B not equal to zero, is the set of all fractions C over D, such that C over D is equivalent to A over B. And here you have some concrete examples which might help clarify any questions you may be having at this point. So for example, this set here, the equivalence class of three over two is equal to this set here with all these fractions in it. And notice they're all the same as three over two. So negative six over negative four is three over two. Negative three over negative two is three over two. Three over two is three over two. Six over four is three over two. So there's infinitely many fractions that are equivalent to three over two. And this set here, which is called the equivalence class of three over two, is the set of all equivalent fractions. The number three over two is called a representative of the equivalence class. And you could have chosen any number uh, there. For example, I could have written bracket negative six over negative four bracket, and that would be exactly the same thing as the set you see here. So equivalence relations are super important. And I think it's really interesting that the book uh, uses them in this way. I don't know of other books that are written at this level that do it. I do have some other books on liberal arts math. I have a few, not too many. And I haven't seen it done yet in other books. Uh, I'm curious if you know if other books do it this way. I just, I thought it was kind of cool. I thought it was kind of a little bit hardcore, right? I mean, this book is written for students who pretty much, you know, their, their math background is maybe a, a, a intermediate algebra class. You know, that's it. They maybe even had, they haven't had college algebra. And so their math is not that strong. Uh, but the author here gently introduces the topics. And I emphasize gently and works his way up and then discusses equivalence classes and equivalence relations, which are such an important concept in the study of mathematics. This is from the section on probability. Here he defines what he means by independent events. Two events A and B are said to be independent if and only if the probability of A intersect B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. And again, he uses that if and only if terminology in the definition, which really isn't required. So if you ever see something like this and it just says if, you have to assume that the if and only if is there, really important. Uh, to know that about mathematical definitions. His example is a beautiful one. Someone is tossing three coins and he's listing out um, the sample space, which here is S. And these are all the possibilities. You know, HHH would be heads on the first flip, heads on the second flip, heads on the third flip. HHT would be heads, heads, tails, etc. And so you have two to the three equals eight uh, possibilities. And then he does an example of a probability there. Really cool, and here's another example. So really nice textbook, really clean. It smells really good. I just gotta give it another whiff. Oh, it smells so good. This book came um, from a private collection and I picked up uh, lots of old books from this era and they all have this, oh, they all have this incredible smell. I just wanna sit here all day and just fumble around with this book and do some problems. It's just really a fun book and I think I think that's one of the things about old books that I really appreciate is that, I don't know, they just kind of, it's just different, you know, it's just kind of fun to take an old book from the past and, you know, you wonder who's learned from this book, who's done the math from this book. It's just a really enjoyable way to spend a nice part of your day. This book is long out of print, I believe, but I will try to find this book online and if I can find it, I will leave a link in the description in case you want to check it out. I didn't buy this book individually. Again, it came as part of a set that I bought a while ago and I'm really happy with it. If you're looking for a fun book that's a little bit different, maybe pick it up. As a collector, I always like to have fun books and that's why I have this one. Anyways, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Until next time, good luck and take care.